book of Malachi, and we will finish up tonight. Book of Malachi, the last prophet uh, in order here. He was the last prophet chronologically for, um, for a long time. There is not going to be another prophet for the nation of Israel. Now, Malachi will give us some pointers about a prophet that will still be yet to come. Um, but there actually won't be any prophets between Malachi and the one that he talks about. But Malachi had written, and we, we covered the first couple of chapters last week, and Malachi had talked about some of the things that uh, had been wrong in, in Judah, in the land, after they had returned from the captivity, some of the old things that they fell back into. They had a hard time seeing it. Remember all the things that Malachi would say? They would say, well, wherein have we done that? Or what are you talking about? Or uh, what do you mean? I don't think we've done that. And so Malachi, um, speaking for the Lord, would go into reasons. He would answer those questions and describe what it was that the Lord had meant. Uh, we finished up uh, most of chapter 2, all but the last verse of chapter 2, uh, where the, the Lord had a controversy against them because of how they had dealt with their families, how they had dealt with their wives. And so the Lord um, continues on. We will pick up here. Uh, with verse number 17, and then get into chapter 3 tonight as we first talk about the Messiah and judgment. Chapter 2, verse 17 is really the introduction to chapter 3. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, well, wherein have we wearied thee? What are you talking about? Right? They're still in that mode of um, doubt, maybe... Um, what are you talking about? We haven't done that. What do you mean we wearied the Lord with our words? Well, here's the answer. When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or, where is the God of judgment? You know, the Bible gives warning. It's actually another place in the Old Testament. We're not going to turn there, but the Bible says, you know, woe to them that call evil good and that call good evil. I believe that it's in the Proverbs that talks about how it's an abomination. It's, it's wrong. It's, it's totally wrong um, to acquit the wicked or to justify the evil. It's not right for us to call things that are wrong good, and it's not right for us to call things that are good wrong. And Malachi says, you've wearied the Lord with your words. And they're like, well, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, this is exactly what you're doing. He says that you, you say one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And then you go on the flip side and you say, well, where is the God of judgment? You know, you've got something evil right in front of you and you call that good and yet something totally different over here, you, you're, you're ready to pronounce judgment upon that over here. You're really ready to call down judgment on this over here. Not on that which is evil, but you know, Things are kind of backwards there, as you see. Where, well, where's the judgment of the Lord? And that's the kind of the preface. That's the introduction for the next section that he's going to talk about. Because Malachi is going to describe for them uh, that the judgment would come. Now, uh, he's also going to talk about the one who will bring the judgment. You know, there is ultimately someday going to come a day of judgment to this world. The day of the Lord is very much a reality. And you'll notice here in chapter 3, verse 1, if you're not sure who will be the judge of this world, notice chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide in the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. 
Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in the former years. And I'll come near to you um, to judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against false swearers, against those that oppress the hireling and his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. When their question came, well, where is the God of judgment? The Lord's reply to them culminates in this. You don't worry about that. Uh, I'm the Lord and I don't change. And this judgment that I promised, it will be accomplished. Ultimately, somebody will come someday that will bring this ultimate judgment. This one, when he comes, he's going to be like a, a refiner's fire. His coming is going to prove what was real and what was fake. His coming will be the ultimate. It's almost like his coming is a revelation. Now, who could this be talking about? Now, we believe that the one that would come and the one that the Lord will ultimately judge to use this world is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read what it says in the book of Acts. Keep your finger there, Malachi 3, but turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 and verse 31. Notice what it says here. It says, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness. And how will he do it? He'll do it by that man whom he hath ordained. Now, if you're not sure who, he's, who that man is, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men and that he hath raised him from the dead. The one that God will use to judge this world ultimately someday is the one that he raised from the dead. Now, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're still not sure that it's talking about Jesus Christ in Malachi chapter 3, Malachi 3 verse 1 says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. Now, apparently, this one that would come someday would be preceded by a forerunner. Someone that would prepare the way. And did you know that Malachi 3 verse 1 is almost quoted uh, verbatim? If you were to look in the scripture here, let's look at, um, let's look in the book of Luke chapter 11. And that's wrong. I'm sorry, Matthew. I said Luke. It's Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 10. For this is he of whom it is written, and notice almost the word for word quote, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. A messenger is sent, one that prepares the way. Now, apparently, according to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ applies these words to John the Baptist, right? In Matthew chapter 11, if you will read, keep reading there in verse 11, after he speaks of the one that would come in Matthew 10 verse, or Matthew 11 verse 10, he speaks of the messenger, the one that prepares the way. Now, who's he going to talk about? Verse 11, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if ye will receive it, this is Elias which was for to come. This is the one that is talking about. Why does he mention Elias there? Why does he say that John the Baptist is the Elias that would come? Well, in Malachi, in Malachi chapter 4, if you'll turn back to our text, chapter 3 and chapter 4, notice Malachi 4 and verse 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah. Malachi chapter 3 ultimately pictures the day when the judge does come. Now, that judge is going to be preceded by a forerunner. 
There'll be one that announces his, his presence. There'll be one that prepares the way before him. And isn't it interesting that John the Baptist did just that? John the Baptist pointed out Jesus Christ and said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. If you don't remember that, that John the Baptist's entire ministry was to prepare the way for Jesus Christ, remember that once Jesus Christ is baptized and begins his public ministry, now John can say, I must decrease. He must increase. I must decrease. Once John prepared the way, once John announced the Messiah, once he had done his job, it was then time for Jesus Christ and his ministry to come to the forefront. It couldn't be any clearer to us now. Looking back 2,000 years later, we wonder, you know, boy, how in the world did they miss that? Because obviously they didn't see Christ as the Messiah. They saw John as a prophet, but if they had remembered the words of Malachi, if they had remembered what had been said, boy, that would have been, that could have been life changing. That could have been entirely, could have been entirely different, couldn't it have been? So Malachi chapter 3, you don't have to worry about this judgment. The judgment will come. Now the one that it will come through will be preceded by the forerunner. So we believe this is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we get a picture of Malachi 3 verse 1 through 6 in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ at his first coming did not bring the ultimate judgment. But he did bring symbolically pictures of that um, refining and that cleansing. You remember when Jesus Christ went into the temple and he cleansed it? What a great picture that Jesus Christ and a portion of his ministry and ultimately his judgment someday is that of purification, uh, of refining, of purifying and bringing them um, through such a judgment. Okay, so uh, we believe absolutely that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the one that has been foretold by the prophets and Malachi compared with the gospels makes that absolutely clear. Jesus Christ was preceded by a forerunner, one that matches the qualifications of Matthew chapter 3 and 4 precisely. Okay? We don't have any doubt that Jesus Christ is who it is speaking of here. So that is the Messiah in his judgment. Let's get back into the next part, Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 7. Because he's going to mention a couple more things. He's going to mention a couple of other sins of the people. In Malachi 3, in verse number 7, it says, Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances, and ye have not kept them. Now return unto me, and I'll return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Now the Lord comes and he begs them to repent. You know, turn back to me, and I'll turn back to you. Get right, do right, and I'll return to you and bless you. And their response is, what are you talking about? How can we return to you? Did we leave? Did we go away? We don't understand what you're talking about. Well, here's the answer. Here's a couple of ways. The first way he mentions in verse number eight, will a man rob God? He says, you guys have robbed the Lord. But yet they say, yet ye have, um, um, will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? in tithes and offerings. Now it appears that when the Jews came back from the captivity and now the temple has been built and things have kind of settled down, folks began to slack in their portion of God's work. Let's read about that real quick. Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13. Real quick, the Bible talks about tithes and offerings. You guys know that in the Old Testament, the Jews were supposed to tithe to the Lord's work. Do you know what a tithe is? Do you kids know what a tithe is? That's a ten. Okay? A tithe is a ten, which really means that it's a tenth. You know, they were to give a tenth. Um, do you guys know what a tenth is? If you have ten of something, a tenth is one. So if they had... Um, I think, is Joe working on some division? If you have 100, a tenth of that, if you were to divide 100 by 10, how many tens are there in 100? There's 10. 
So a tithe, if you were to have $100, a tithe would be $10. And that's what they were supposed to contribute to the work of the Lord. They did that by way of giving it to the Levites. And the Levites managed the Lord's work in the Old Testament. That was the way that God had set it up. You can read about it in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy. They, they were required to give a tenth. They were required to give that, um, they were required to give their first fruits to the Lord. You know, some folks have a different attitude about giving to the Lord. Um, some folks have the attitude that, you know, okay, I've got, I got, um, I got to pay the mortgage and I got to pay for the car and we got to pay for the gas and we got to pay for the utilities and we got to pay for the groceries and we got to pay for Disney plus and we got to pay for cable and we got to pay, you know, we got to go out a couple of nights and, um, you know, when we get to the end of the month, if there's anything left, that's what we'll give to the, that's what we'll give to God. Is that a good plan? Is that a good plan that if you have anything left over, you'll give it to God? Is that a good idea? It sounded like a good idea, right? Give, give God what you have left over. But actually, God wanted them to give to him first. You know, if you get to the end of the month, you'll often find um, when you put God last, there's not actually any room left for him. If you put God first, it becomes a different story. Okay? Um, that was what Israel was required to do. Okay? Now, we could talk about that for New Testament times. We could talk about some of the different commands um, that are given in the Old Testament. Are they applicable to the New Testament? Um, you know, some people talk about tithing, and they say, well, that was just under the Old Testament law. That was something that was given to Israel. Uh, and that's true. The command was given. Um, it's interesting that Abraham paid a tithe, and he didn't live under the law. But he contributed to the priest. He contributed to Melchizedek. He contributed to the work of the Lord. That's something for us to keep in mind, you know, that, that God expects his people to contribute so that his public work can continue to go on. You know, that's why we happily bring our tithes and offerings on the Lord's Day. What Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, when you come on the first day of the week, you know, be, be gladly willing and able to contribute. But that was their command. They were absolutely commanded to tithe. Now, Nehemiah chapter 13, we're back, from the, we're back from the captivity. Things have settled down. Temple's been rebuilt. But notice Nehemiah 13, verse 10. Nehemiah 13, verse 10. And I perceived that the portion had not been given them. Now, who was supposed to give a portion to the Levites? Everybody was supposed to give a portion to the Levites, right? That was, that, that was what the tithe was. Everybody was to contribute to the work of the Lord. The Levites were the tribe that were dedicated and separated to God's public ministry. So the folk contributed to them. And yet Nehemiah here in this passage even tells us, I perceive that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. The Levites and the singers that did the work were fled everyone to his field then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil under the treasuries. It seems like this is something Israel kind of needed to be reminded about regularly. Because it seemed like that had slacked. And in the book of Nehemiah, they had to be warned about it. And they had to be told, hey, bring it. And then you get to the book of Malachi. Whether or not it's referencing the same event, I don't know. Maybe it is. But there was a warning there that you guys have robbed me. And they said, what are you talking about? Well, you haven't, you haven't given that which I commanded you to give. So in Malachi 3, verse 9, it says, You're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast your fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. Isn't that interesting what the Lord promises to give? what the Lord promises to do for them if they'll be obedient. You know, 
Bring it into the storehouse. Do that which I have commanded you. And the Lord speaks about how he would bless them. He would actually bless them in ways that they couldn't even imagine. He says that he'll protect them in verse 11 from the devourer. You know, the Lord always promised his people that when they were obedient and followed him, he would protect them. You remember in the Old Testament when the Lord commanded the men of Israel to go up three times a year to Jerusalem to go to these feasts? Do you remember the promise that was connected with that? How he would supply and how he would protect them? You know, I can imagine one of the thoughts is that, you know, well, okay, but... If, if we tithe or if we give of the first fruits, if we give this tithe, tithe, what if something happens? You know, what if something happens and the crop can't produce and, and we, you know, we've contributed this portion and then we don't have anything left to live on? What did that say in verse number 11? Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. You don't have to worry about the loss of crops or... Um, or things not producing on time. You can give to the Lord first, Israel, and trust that God will produce for you according to the natural time. Okay, so any fear that they had, the Lord squashes it. Okay, I'm not, he doesn't just tell them um, to give, he doesn't just tell them to tithe and hope that it works out for the best. No, be obedient. He tells Israel to tithe. And he promises that he'll provide and that he'll protect them. So um, the command that they had been given, they certainly had incentive to, to perform and to do. Look at verse 12. And all nations shall call you blessed. For you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Your words have been stout against me. Yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Here's the next thing. Not only... Um, not only had they robbed the Lord in tithes and offerings, but they started to speak wrong about God. Verse, verse 14, ye have said, and I bet you can't imagine God's people saying words like this, but ye have said it is vain to serve God. Can you imagine God's people saying it doesn't really matter if you serve God or not? And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts. Can you imagine God's people saying that, that it doesn't matter? What good, it, what good does it do to serve God? And Malachi says, that's what you guys have said. You guys have said that it's vain to serve God. You've, you've said that it doesn't matter if you serve God and that there's no benefit to serving God. It doesn't matter really if you do or if you don't. That's heavy stuff. Now, let me encourage everybody to know that it is not vain to serve God. When Satan spoke to God about Job, he said, Doth Job serve thee, or doth Job fear thee for naught? Um, listen, there is ample reason to trust to believe, to be faithful, to serve, to obey God. It's not vain. It's not empty. It absolutely does matter. And if you get to the point where you feel, you know what, does it even matter if I serve God? That is, that is a condition that according to verse number seven needs to be repented of. You know, if you get to the point, and I don't know sometimes if maybe you've gotten to that point because you're angry or maybe you've gotten to that point because you're discouraged. Or maybe you've gotten to that point because somebody that claims the name of God has done you wrong. And so you think, Man, is it even worth it? Everybody's a fake. There's no reason to be serious. There's no reason to serve God. It doesn't seem to matter one way or another, whether we do or whether we don't. Um, the Lord tells them in verse number seven, return unto me. That's a condition that needs to be repented of. They say, well, what are you talking about? What do you mean we need to return to you? Well, apparently you guys don't think that it really matters if you serve God. You say it's vain. You say in verse number 14, it, what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance? That is not a condition that we as God's people want to get in where we start to feel that it doesn't matter and that it's not worth it 
to serve God. Okay? I'm not telling you that it's worth it to serve God because, you know, if you serve God, you're going to end up with a lot of money. And so that'll make it worth it. I'm not saying that if you serve God, that's a guarantee that you'll never have any problems in this world. And so that'll, means, that'll show you it'll be worth it. I can promise you that when you get to the end of this life and you have served God and you stand before him, I guarantee you it was worth it. Okay? Okay. All right. And now verse 15, we call the proud happy, yea, they that work wickedness are set up, yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. They got everything backwards. Everything's absolutely backwards. And yet, as there is in every generation, God always has a faithful remnant. Verse, 15, or verse 16, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not." There is always a remnant. There is always that faithful few from verse 16 and 17. There is always a portion. Listen, not everybody's fake. I know from those previous verses, a lot of people didn't think that it mattered. There's always a group of people that think to take it serious, though. There will always be a group of people that trust and believe that what we're doing matters, that our service to God is not in vain, that being faithful is absolutely worth it. And time will ultimately reveal those things you know that it will ultimately be revealed it says there in verse number 18 the day shall come then shall you return and you'll be able to discern between the righteous and the wicked between the him that serveth god and him that serveth him not it's 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 interesting to theorize but I tell you what someday the discernment's going to be real Someday it's going to really be rel it's going to be really be revealed. It's going to be known as that remnant makes themselves known. Okay? So of all the things that he's mentioned, of all the of all the things in these first 3 chapters that he said that you guys have messed up or that you guys have done and you've said, "No, oh, what are you talking about? We didn't do that." And he's made it clear that you have. Listen, trust and know he's calling them to repent. He's calling them to return. And ultimately, that remnant, that faithful group will ultimately reveal themselves. They'll ultimately be seen. It may be, it very well may be um, that, Matthew, that Malachi chapter 3 is right and the ultimate revelation of those doesn't come until the ultimate day of judgment. That may be the day that it's ultimately revealed who were truly the followers of the Lord and who weren't. Um, Something about that in Matthew chapter 7. But trust and know it's absolutely worth it. Okay? All right, let's close, let's close out chapter 4 here with this last message. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and, all, and the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So again, that day of judgment is coming. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Now I want you to notice the difference between verses 1 and verse 2. When Jesus comes back, there are two totally different ways that that is received. To one group it's received in judgment. It's like the burning of an oven. It's destruction. It's trouble. It's bad news. And yet, verse 2 gives you a totally different context. It speaks of the sun of righteousness. It's, it's pictured like the sun coming up, right? Now, now, sun in my Bible is capitalized, so it's obviously talking about a person. But you get that imagery of, of the sun shining, the sun rising, and it rises with healing in his wings. You go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. 
Listen, can you get a more contrasted idea than verse 1 and verse 2? And yet it's the same event. It's the same judgment that some may, some, some may look at as trouble, as burning, as very, very bad. And yet another group looks at it as very, very good. What event could be like that other than Jesus coming back, right? A day where a big old portion of this world dreads it. And yet another portion longs for it, looks for it, hopes for it. And ye shall tread down the wicked, and they shall be as ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. So obey. Be faithful. Okay? They ask at the end of chapter 2, well, where is the judgment of the Lord? You don't worry about the Lord's part. The Lord will take care of the judgment. He's got the judgment under control. But he reveals to them what they can work on, how they need to repent, and know that an ultimate day is coming. And there are going to be to totally different ways that day is received. It's Jesus. And again, if you're not sure that it's Jesus, behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And ye shall turn the heart, he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, again, in Luke chapter one, that's speaking of John the Baptist. In Luke chapter one, when Zechariah and Elizabeth are told that they are going to have a son, it tells them here in verse 17, Luke chapter 1, verse 17, And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Malachi closes the Old Testament. But when you close the Old Testament, here's what you are left with. Okay? Here's what you're left with is the close of the Old Testament. Somebody's coming. Actually, two people are coming. The Messiah, the one that will ultimately judge this world, the one that ultimately will be responsible for um, the ultimate governing of this world. But right before he comes, he's going to be preceded. He'll be preceded by a forerunner. And it gives you ways to tell who that is. And then the book of Malachi closes. And God doesn't say another word prophetically for 400 years. But notice real quick what Mark chapter 1 says. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, what is the beginning of the gospel? As it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And it goes on to talk about John the Baptist. Malachi closes. God doesn't say another thing. For 400 years. But here comes John the Baptist on the scene. And guess what? Malachi said that's how it would be. Be on the lookout. Be on the lookout for the Messiah that's coming. And I'm telling you, you'll be able to know that it's him because he'll be preceded by a forerunner. And when the New Testament opens up, here's the forerunner. And that's the beginning of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that came and announced him and prepared the way before him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The ministry of John the Baptist becomes really, really important. Do you remember in, in the book of Acts, chapter 1, after Jesus Christ had ascended and the apostles and the first church were meeting there and they said, You know, we really need to replace Judas. We really need to find someone to fill that spot. Um, do you remember the qualifications that they said? Beginning with the baptism of John. They made sure that the one that they selected to fill Judas's spot was someone that had seen it all. 
Because if you hadn't seen the baptism of John, if you didn't start there, you didn't see it all. And that is how the Old Testament ends. It starts to put in our minds, okay, somebody's coming, and he's going to be announced by a forerunner. And amazingly, it's separated in your Bible by just a couple of pages. It was separated in time by about 400 years. But just like Malachi closes, the New Testament opens. The Old Testament ends by telling you to look for the forerunner. And the New Testament begins with the forerunner coming on the scene, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right. We are through. That is all of the minor prophets. Okay. Prophets that came, came to Judah, sometimes before, sometimes during, sometimes after the captivity. But there were some major themes, right? Um, the captivity was coming, judgment upon them for their sins, the, the, the coming Messiah, the ultimate judgment of the Gentile nations, uh, the restoration of Israel, and the kingdom of Messiah. And as this book closes, as the twelve, as they would have been called in the Hebrew Bible, but they would have been combined together and called the twelve, it ends by saying, look, watch, he's coming. You ask where the judgment's coming from, I'll tell you about the one that will bring judgment. And the next book of the Bible that opens introduces him to us. All right. Father, we're grateful to come today. We're thankful.